Good morning. Let's wait for everybody else to get into their seat. There go. All right, today is uh, August 20, 21st, yes, uh, 2011. Um, good morning to all. Do we have any new members, visitors? Hello there, welcome. I know we got another, yep, there we go, all right, yep. Okay, my name is uh, Alex Jules, and I am the histor historian for the Fellowship of Free Thought, and I'm tired. Um, <laughs> uh, we actually have a very interesting, um, interesting uh, theme or topic today. It, it, it does touch a little bit on what's been going on in our particular community, but I also want to have a broader discussion a little bit on scandals and diversity. All right, okay. Let's do this. So what is a scandal? A scandal is a widely publicized allegation or set of allegations uh, that damage or tries to damage the reputation of institution, individual, or creed. Scandal may be based on a true or false allegation or a mixture of both. It comes from a Greek word I will not try to pronounce right now, um, which means trap or stumbling block. Now, no particular community uh, or demographic is immune to scandal. It's common in politics, politics, policy, uh, religion, and in families as well. Uh, it, it is, its effects are often divisive, chaotic, and often do nothing more than remind us that we are human and quite often petty. Um, whether it is in a sorted back room, the Vatican, or an ethics committee investigation, a scandal often, but not always, gets people talking. So let's talk about a few of them. So Watergate is the original scandal, right? The original gate. It, um, it got its name from the Watergate Hotel, where two politically motivated burglaries took place in 1972. The Watergate scandal ultimately led to the resignation of US President Richard Nixon in 74, of course. That brought on national discourse on ethics and politics. We also had Iran Gate or Contra Gate, also referred to as um, the Iran Contra Affair. Uh, the Reagan administration sold weapons to Iran, diverted the proceeds to Contra rebels in Nicaragua. Uh, we also, and that also had us talking at a national level about ethics in politics. There's always a recurring theme there. Uh, we also had Katrina Gate, uh, used by people who disapproved of the government's response to Hurricane Katrina. Uh, but again, that brought national discourse on emergency management, but also race in politics. Unfortunately, we haven't gotten over that one. Uh, we also had Kanye Gate, uh, which, uh, <laughs> uh, for those of you who actually keep up with it, Kanye West interrupted Taylor Swift. Uh, acceptance speech for Best Female Video in 2009, MTV Music Awards, saying, well, Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time, but that also was uh, very, very subjective, right? Um, but that actually brought a lot of national discourse on decency and respect in entertainment, so that was actually very interesting. Uh, my favorite one is actually, is it up there? Yeah, it is, uh, Closet Gate. Uh, the controversy that erupted following the broadcast of South Park episode Trapped in the Closet, a satirical parody of the Church of Scientology and some of its fam famous adherents, such as Tom Cruise. Uh, again, that brought uh, a lot of discourse on censorship and the influence of uh, uh, Hollywood money. Um, so some of those names are, are, are easy to follow, some of them are, are not. Um, when I saw them, I was like, I, I had to do a little research on it. So Nipplegate uh, was, anyone want to take a guess at what that, that was? Janet Jackson, there we go. And Tenagate. Anyone got an iPhone? Right, iPhone, right, yep. Pedalgate. Anyone drive a Toyota, exactly. All right, okay. Now, there are three parts to the next one, right? Because it happened, okay. Troopergate, version one. Allegations by two Arkansas state troopers that they arranged liaisons with then Governor Bill Clinton. Troopergate number two. Uh, con controversy involving 
New York governor, Elliot Spitzer, who allegedly ordered the state police to create special records of Senate Majority Leader Joseph Bruno's whereabouts when he traveled with police escorts in New York City. And the most recent one, Troopergate number three, involving Sarah Palin, exactly. Uh, the 2008 vice uh, president nominee for the United States presidential election fired the state's public safety commissioner allegedly for not cooperating with her demand that he dismiss her former brother-in-law, a state trooper. Palin prefers the uh, term taser gate, a reference to the allegation that the trooper used a taser on his 10-year-old stepson. Okay. So now what, uh, whether the discussion leads to anything substantive or not is very subjective, but it does give us an opportunity to discuss on occasion real issues. So today's scandal, Elevator Gate. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about that a little bit, um, a little bit later on. Okay, so um, I know many of you are over it, many of you know what it's about, et cetera. It, include, it uh, was Rebecca Watson, Richard Dawkins, it got blown up significantly. But there's a reason it did. We could have left it, and it continues to be propagated, uh, the discussion continues to be propagated in our community. There's a reason why it didn't get dismissed as uh, just another, another issue of uh, sex and gender relations. Um, there is, as Greta Christina and others have posited, a problem in the free thought community of diversity and diversity awareness. We tend to have a community that is represented, for the most part, by people who look like Dawkins, Dennett, Hitchens, and Harris. Uh, given their somewhat varied backgrounds, they tend to be somewhat homogenous, except for the accents. And whether enlightened scholars or free thinkers, they fall into the typical face of free thought, white men of privilege in academia. But as the faces of free thought, or the face of free thought, um, do they have an obligation to be more sensitive to the upcoming, more diverse faces of free thought? And as a community that is trying to foster new faces and relations, what should we be doing about it? When you look at the current uh, national statistics, this is what we look like, right? Uh, when you take a look at uh, just generally white, Hispanics are, are, are the, the numbers get a little bit muddied, but when, you're, when you deal with uh, the Hispanic population, we've got about 12%. Uh, black, we've got, a, uh, excuse me, white, we've got, um, six, there we go, 69%. Black is 12%. American Indian and ex Eskimo, 3%. Asian, less than 1%. Hawaiian and Pacific Islander, also less than 1%. And then you have others. Um, but did you know that in the US there is less than a 1% difference between male and female, right? So 50, 50 almost, right? Depending on, on the year, it's 51 versus 50 or 49 versus 50, et cetera, um, excluding the margin of error. Making women technically the majority according to the 2000 census, um, but just about everywhere women are underrepresented. Um, now, before I ask the question, I will state that of the organizations I tend to be affili affiliated with, this tends to be um, the most diverse, us and, and MA. Uh, but I want to ask the question anyway. So if I look around us, how many women do we have in the room? Are we close to half? Yeah, go ahead. Let's, 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 let's raise your hand. Raise your hand. Right. Okay. All right. <laughs> you got told on. Uh, <laughs> all right. And according to the numbers, we have 12% African American. Did it happen again? It sure did. Am, am, am I the only one again? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> today, today, today. Uh, <laughs> now, multiracial, uh, two races like my children, so they, they wouldn't count, right? Uh, Hispanic and Latino varies between 12 and 16%, uh, but again, 
let's see, how many Latinos do we have in here? Today, any Latino? Yeah, okay. So now, of course, uh, I know that there are specific cultural reasons why these two minorities aren't usually represented in the free thought community, which raises the question, what are we gonna do to change that? What are we going to do about it? If you take a look at <clears throat> the, um, the Pew, um, that's not mine. All right, <laughs> at the Pew survey, um, you'll see that the problem with African-American um, religion or the population in general is they tend to be extremely religious. Um, they push closer to the 70, almost 80% of their population being hyper-religious, right? When you take a look at women in religion, right, also we will not see uh, a majority of women in free thought given that women tend to be also significantly more religious. Now, in terms of uh, religion locally, let's bring this home, um, it's even harder because if you take a look at this particular slide, we have somewhat of a bleak picture down there with only 67, with 67 percent of the population saying that they're religious, believe in God, or religion has significant um, uh, matter in their life. But it's only 67%. It really is. I, you, know, you take a look at places like Mississippi, it's pushing 82, right? So um, I used to, I, I am actually quite used to being the only black person in various situations, like work. Engineering isn't uh, <laughs> as diverse as you would think. Uh, so when I started to come to these events a few years ago, I didn't expect a whole lot of diversity, but I, I didn't think I was going to be the only one. Um, now, when, uh, and now we know that even in minority communities, whether, uh, where religi relig religiosity has run amok, the churches are losing members. Um, are we offering an environment where people of any racial, ethnic, or sexual orientation uh, or origin feel comfortable in moving forward? How are we going to make them feel like they have a voice even if it's a minor one? It's hard coming out, you may lose a lot. Uh, but in those communities, it's nearly equivalent to social suicide. You're an outcast. So you find a place where you're accepted for what you think, for who you are, but you feel, implied or otherwise, rejection for who you were born as the one thing you have no control over. There was a New York uh, Times article this week, um, black scientists seeking grants at the NIH, uh, far, far worse than anyone else, right? In the study, 83,000 grant applications from 2000 to 2006 were reviewed. For every 100 applicants submitted by white scientists, 29, 29 were awarded grants for every 100 Appli applications from black scientists, 16. The comparison was made um, when it was rationalized for a track record, similar background, the only difference, the only difference was race. So it shows that education and our community tends to be somewhat more educated, is not inoculated from prejudice, right? So, the question I pose to you is what are you gonna do about it? Okay, with that, <laughs> I'm gonna bring Dr. Fisher up here. He's gonna cover a little bit about what ha actually happened during Elevated Gate. So many of you are probably aware of this already, but for those of you who are pleasantly ignorant of all the stuff going on on the internet, uh, which uh, I, uh, MVU. Um, <laughs> uh, here's just a, a little primer of what happened with Elevator Gate. Uh, so I guess the, the initial starter is this is Rebecca Watson, who I guess she's not the skeptic, but she's the head skeptic, I guess. Um, and uh, she's talking about an incident at a conference in Dublin, Ireland. The response was really fascinating. The response at the conference itself was wonderful. Um, there are a ton of great feminists there, male and female, and also just open-minded people who had maybe never really considered the, um, the way that women are treated in this community, but were 
interested in learning more. So thank you to everyone who was at that conference who uh, engaged in those discussions outside of that panel. Um, you were all fantastic. I love talking to you guys. Um, all of you except for the, the one man who um, didn't really grasp, I think, what I was saying on the panel because um, at the bar later that night, actually at four in the morning, um, we were at the hotel bar. 4 a.m. I said, you know, I've had enough guys, I'm exhausted, going to bed. Uh, so I walked to the elevator and a man got on the elevator with me and said, don't take this the wrong way, but I find you very interesting and I would like to talk more. Would you like to come to my hotel room for coffee? Um, just a word to the wise here, guys, uh, don't do that. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, I don't really know how else to explain how this makes me incredibly uncomfortable, but I'll just sort of lay it out that I was a single woman, you know, in a foreign country at 4 a.m. in a hotel elevator with you just you and I don't invite me back to your hotel room <laughs> right after I finished talking about how it creeps me out and makes me uncomfortable when men sexualize me in that manner so yeah um, but everybody else seemed to really get it and and thank you for, for getting uh -huh. it. so uh, lots of people responded to this in various ways there are a lot of people who are supportive and agreeing with her and you know lots of people who uh, uh, thought she was overreacting, and some of the internet creeps that you always get on the internet who thought she wasn't hot enough to actually uh, be propositioned in an elevator, and some people saying that she should have been raped in the elevator. So you know, there's uh, you know all kinds of you know people on the internet, of course, um, and you know a lot of this probably would have gone by like most uh, horrible chat room discussions do. Um, but uh, part of the reason why this uh, attracted a lot more attention is because a very big name figure um, who uh, many of us know and respect, uh, Richard. Dawkins uh, weighed in um, in a way that many people took to be controversial. So um, here's what he wrote. This was engaging in a discussion thread on the blog Ferengula. Um, so he wrote, uh, Dear Muslima, stop whining, will you? Yes, yes, I know you had your genitals mutilated with a razor blade. And Jan, don't tell me yet again. I know you aren't allowed to drive a car or leave the house without a male family member, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, but stop whining, will you? Think of the suffering your poor American sisters have to put up with. Only this week I heard of one, she calls herself Skeptic, and do you know what happened to her? A man in a hotel elevator invited her back to his room for coffee. I am not exaggerating. He really did. He invited her back to his room for coffee. Of course she said no, and of course he didn't lay a finger on her, but even so. And you, Ms. Lima, think you have misogyny to complain about. For goodness sake, grow up, or at least grow a thicker skin. Signed, Richard. Um, and Ferengula did. Uh, confirm that this was the real Richard Dawkins, not somebody else. And of course, lots of people responded to this um, in various ways. Uh, you know, one common response was to say, well, to point out that there are worse things happening doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, fight the smaller bad things that are happening also. And in a later post, uh, Dawkins sort of acknowledged that response. He said, well, I sarcastically compared Rebecca's plight with that of women in Muslim countries. Um, and people have pointed out that's no defense of something slightly bad to point to something worse. Um, we should fight all bad things, the slightly bad as well as the very bad, fair enough. And then he said, but my point is that the slightly bad thing suffered by Rebecca wasn't even slightly bad, it was zero bad. Um, and so uh, that's you know, gotten a lot of discussion going where there are people uh, you know, all ends of the spectrum saying that this is zero bad and this is overreaction, over politically correct. Uh, feminist uh, stuff going on and other people thinking that you know, Rebecca Watson is is on to something that's of significant concern in our community and so there's been a whole lot of discussion, some of it quite vitriolic. So for those of you who don't know what Elevator Gate is, now you have at least the briefest introduction and I think Gajeen especially in her talk will be bringing more context to this as well, but at least you have a sense of the sorts of issues that have come up with this. And so we're gonna have uh, several talks today um, and an activity having to do with uh, thinking about especially the way that women in the free thought community are treated in ways that we might, uh, perhaps without knowing it, be unwelcoming in ways that we could do uh, better to be more welcoming to get our community more diverse. So that's the stuff we're going to talk about, but we're going to start off with a song from our band uh, in honor of talking about inviting people for coffee. Uh, they're going to sing Taylor the Latte Boy.
Some people think that being invited for coffee is bad, and others of us think it might be a fun thing. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. There's a boy who works at Starbucks who is very inspirational. He is very inspirational because of many things. I come in at 8-11 and he smiles and says, How are you? When he smiles and says, How are you? I could swear my heart grows wings. So today at 8-11, I decided I should meet him. I decided I should meet him in a proper formal way. So today at 8-11, when he smiled and said, How are you? I said, fine, my name is Kathy. And he softly answered, Hey. I told him, yes, my name is Kathy. And thank you for the extra And he said his name was Taylor, which provides the inspiration for this poem. Taylor, the latte boy, bring me Java, bring me joy. Oh, Taylor, the latte boy, I love him, I love him, I love him. And I'd like to get my nerve up and recite my poem musical. He would like the fact it's musical because he plays guitar. So today at 8-11, Taylor told me he was playing in a bar down in the village in the basement of a bar. And he smoothly flipped the lever to prepare my double latte. But for me, he made it triple, and he didn't think I knew. But I saw him flip the lever, and it me he made it triple. And I knew he triple latte meant that Taylor loved me true. I said, what time are you playing? And thank you for the extra He said, keep the 355 because this triple latte was on him. Taylor, the latte boy, bring me Java, bring me joy. Oh, Taylor, the latte boy, I love him, I love him, I love him.
So if you spend too much time on the internet like I do, you'd know about elevator gate already, and you also might know uh, what we discovered a bit too late is that there's another writing of this song written from uh, a different perspective, written from Taylor's perspective, and I'll show you just a little bit of, of this uh, so you get a sense of how it goes. Um, I think I she comes in every morning at exactly 8.11. When the clock says 8.11, she comes walking through that door, and then one faithful morning, as she made her usual entrance, I could tell that she was nervous, and she had something to say. So I smoothly flipped the lever to prepare her double latte, and she said her name was Amy, and I came back with hey. And I told her my name's Taylor, and here's a little extra for when she left, I cleaned her table and found a folded napkin with this bowl. So there's an example of how, uh, I guess, actions uh, from taken from different perspectives might seem to be utterly harmless from one perspective and quite scary and creepy from another perspective. And that, that's the sort of thing uh, that, you know, I guess was going on in Elevate, Elevator Gate, perhaps. And that's the sort of stuff that Melanie's going to be talking about now, how to seem uh, cool and not creepy to people. So uh, <laughs> Melanie has a, a brief tutorial for us. <laughs> Yes, my name is, is Melanie Clemmer, and my uh, impressive credentials are that I am a woman and uh, sometimes cannot sleep because somebody is wrong on the internet. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> when Justin originally asked me to give a talk, I thought that I would focus strictly on communicating between um, the, the sexes, um, specifically in or in out of elevators. But the more reading and I did, and the more discussions that I had, it indicated to me that it would probably be a little bit more productive if uh, I would talk more about how to become a safe, welcoming community uh, in general, we being the, the atheist community. And uh, I actually thought that the elevator metaphor could still kind of work because I, I used to be a, um, still am a big fan of the game show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? And they would actually have a routine about who you would and would not want to be on an elevator with. So I will kind of try to tie that in. And so I'm gonna offer a few thoughts on what we as the free thought community can do to be more safe and welcoming. And I am still gonna talk a little bit about what we as individuals can do. Um, one of the things that we can do as a group is to have more women, more people of color, more LGBT people in visible leadership positions. Uh, I'm not talking about putting somebody in a position that they don't have uh, the skills or, or the inclination for. Um, unfortunately, though, sometimes we assume that because statistically we don't have as many women, um, African Americans, et cetera, in the community, that we don't have anyone from those groups who can be in visible leadership positions. So we need to find ways for everyone to use his and her skills and you know make everybody visible so think about it who would you like to step on an elevator with do you want to be on an elevator with a diverse group of people or just uh, where you're the only person who's visibly different from everyone there the second thing that we can do as a community is to show that we welcome discussions on feminism racism homosexuality etc 
The African-American blogger Ian Cromwell has long advocated incorporating anti-racism as a skeptical approach. So we as a community then can show that we are capable of tacking, tackling the social issues rationally and that we find these discussions as serious as the scientific ones. So let me give you an example um, based on some Facebook and Google Plus drama that I, I witnessed, because there's never any drama on the internet. Um, I, th I think it was PZ Myers had posted a link to an article about a female scientist who had experienced um, some sexism at CERN. One um, majority commentator groaned, why do we have to keep talking about this? Why can't we go back to talking about particle physics or difficult questions like, do I like Kirk or do I like Picard? Um, <laughs> in other words, if it's not science or if it's not something white and nerdy, you know, per, per Weird Al, it's not important. Now, at about the same time, I also saw a Facebook discussion on who was more talented, Madonna or, or Lady Gaga. Uh, stay with me, it's, it's important. So, And I know our own Alex Jules mentioned how welcome it was to actually discuss something besides elevators, racism, et cetera. So this contrast of the one person who was just very dismissive of issues, talking about issues of sexism, and then the person of color who battles these issues on a day-to-day -day basis and is talking about this a lot, that contrast really hit me hard. And so I think most human beings are going to feel more welcome when the daily workings of their life and their daily battles are going to be taken seriously. Now, I think Alex had a very good point and that keeping things a little bit on the light side or a lot on the light side sometimes can be more welcoming as well. So it's not like there isn't room, room for that, but I think there's also plenty of room to discuss the, the more serious issues as well. So um, to go back to the elevator metaphor, I think that I would be willing, more willing to get on an elevator with people who you know, thought might take me seriously if they all had t-shirts with like, you know, racist slogans on them, you know, I, tea party, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't want to get on the elevator. A third thing we can do related to the above point is to approach our discussions with a little humility. I think it's very easy as atheists to be, dare I say, a little bit arrogant when it comes to our stance on social issues. It's easy to say, well, we certainly aren't racist or homophobic or sexist like those silly religious people, you know, neener, neener, neener. Um, and I think we've actually done a pretty good job here at FOF, but some of us have grown up with certain privileges, and we're actually gonna do an activity related to that afterward. We've grown up with certain privileges that blind us to other people's experiences. So if someone does call us out for making um, an albeit unintentional remark that could be perceived as racist or sexist, maybe we need to take more of a how can I learn from you approach instead of a here's why I'm right uh, approach. Um, and one other thing that I'd like to add to that is that um, one of the things that I know uh, as far as humility goes, sometimes it's easy to get into like, well, I'm a better feminist than you, or it's like I'm more anti-racist than, than you are, and I really don't think that's, that's productive or, or creates a self safe, welcoming atmosphere. Um, we can also make the atheist community one that looks out for each other. Um, once again, Ian Cromwell points out that in the African-American community, the church functions as a community center. And I know uh, I'm, I'm a, a dietitian for the uh, VA and I work in home care. And I know a lot of times if we have um, one of our patients that needs food, uh, it's like we, we send them to a church because we don't always have, you know, nowhere, nowhere else to send them because there are churches that have food pantries and stuff. But anyway, we can do simple things like help each other um, move like we did with Stacy a few weeks ago. We can do more public things like marching in, in the pride parade um, like we're planning on doing 
um, next month and other things to help each other out. The fifth suggestion is to actively fill the gaps we believe might be keeping people away. For example, the Richard Dawkins Foundation has been sponsoring childcare um, for uh, events like the Texas Free Thought Convention so that uh, more women, or in other words, everybody in the family can actually come to the conventions. It has also been suggested that events like the Amazing Meeting offer scholarships for those who can't afford to pay. In other words, even if there aren't any signs that say, you know, no black people on this elevator, sometimes there are hidden barriers and we need to um, remove them so we can get where we're going. And now for some more personal things we can do as individuals. Um, number one, be careful of the attention that you are giving to new people <laughs> at meetings. In some cases, it can be intimidating to be the only um, dark face in a white crowd or the only woman in, in a group of, of men. Some people have learned how to deal with being outnumbered, and some people, I think, actually kind of like it, but others find the concept of being stared at um, like a zoo animal or a piece of meat a little bit off-putting, and I think we're actually going to be, uh, since great minds think alike, I think Justin is bringing up a video that kind of shows that later on. Um, you can give positive attention by introducing the new person to a variety of people, um, showing them around versus sticking them in a, in a corner. Um, I think it also helps to get to know somebody before offering, offering them compliments. At my first atheist meeting, and it, it wasn't here, I just have to say that, I found myself cornered by a man who wouldn't leave me alone even when I turned my back to talk to other people. If I turned around, he, he was there. Um, and I didn't feel threatened, but it was a little uh, annoying. Um, and uh, he also, there was a meal after this particular event, and he said, well, you need to come to uh, dinner with us, and if anything, so I can continue to look at you because you're so beautiful. Um, I don't mind compliments on my personal appearance at all. Um, but telling me something like, um, please come to dinner with us, I think you would have a lot to contribute to our discussion, would have made me feel a little bit more like I was part of the group instead of like, here you are, sit here so we can all lo look at you. Um, you also want to be careful about making assumptions about why people are there, particularly if it's a mixed group of like singles, um, you know, married people, people with, with kids as well. Um, maybe that person is there to find a spouse or a date or, or, or a hookup. Um, I found out later that apparently a, a lot of these gatherings, like the amazing meeting, et cetera, are these, for some people, just sexually charged um, meetings, and that's what people go there for. I'm like, well, I, I didn't know, <laughs> okay? And I know I'm not the only person that, that didn't know. So, but, you know, maybe there are people looking for that. Maybe that person is just hoping to find um, a group of like-minded friends to hang out with. Um, as the video after me, maybe they're there ju just there to buy some comic books. Um, maybe that person is a new atheist, and he or she is just hoping to find a safe space where they can ask questions and, um, you know, not get, if they say, if they ask a question, not get, you know, jumped on like they would in some other communities. Um, if you're just assuming that the person is there, you know, only to find a, a date or a spouse or something, that can seem to lead to some unwanted behavior. And so sometimes a simple, so what brings you here or how did you find us can be a good icebreaker as far as, you know, figuring out everybody's intentions. Some people are actually, I found out, more, more direct, um, and they don't even have to use coffee, you know, as the, it's like they just say it. It's like, come back to my room for casual sex. Um, <laughs> if you do want to get to know another individual, it's okay to ask them to meet you at another time and place. A straight, 
I want to get to know you better, but um, I don't want to monopolize your time right now. Um, it, it can go a long way. Uh, do make your approach preferably in a well-lit, non-confining, public place. And uh, I would suggest that your first meeting also be in a, in a similar place, Starbucks, um, wine bar, if you're me, um, whatever. <laughs> if you see a person who does look trapped, don't be afraid to help them. Um, I think that it's better to risk being labeled a white knight than it is to miss out the, uh, on the opportunity to help someone else. If you are kind of helping bring that person out of whatever corner they got trapped in or wherever position they're looking very uncomfortable, and just bring them out, introduce them to the larger group, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna be less likely to have that appellation of the white knight in any way. So um, don't be afraid to help people out. So, who do you want to be on that elevator with? It looks like you want to be on an elevator with a diverse group of people. It also looks like we want people who take the concerns of other people seriously. Uh, we want people who can learn from each other and who look out from one another. And finally, we want to be able to get to where we're going in the first place without anything holding us back. So, and I think now we have um, Hot Girl in the Comic Shop by Tripod. <laughs> <laughs> was a hot girl in the comic shop and I didn't know what to do. There was a hot girl in the comic shop, she was looking for a doctor who. Oh ha! Oh ha! There was an actual girl in the comic shop, what a momentous day. I had to check to make sure that she wasn't just a human-sized cardboard display. My competition was a kid with pimples and a guy in a wheelchair So I knew I had to act fast There was a hot girl in the comic shop Where I'd never seen a girl before A kind of indie looking girl in the comic shop And she knew her way around the store She's moving towards the role-playing games Oh my god, she's picking out dice So many questions in my mind What would be a good pickup line? Why had a hot girl just come in If the Hulk fought Spider-Man Who would win? I guess that Spider-Man's advantage would be his webs and his manual dexterity. But then again, the Hulk's endurance is limitless and is stronger than Spidey. <laughs> it's so hard to know. It's so hard to know. There was. girl in the comic shop about ten minutes ago hot girl in the comic shop did anyone see her go had she come to the comic shop looking for love I guess I'll never Okay, so uh, I'll move this on. Uh, next up, we're uh, going to do an activity. So I'll just say a little bit uh, about the activity. Part of uh, 
why we thought this would be a, a good activity to do is you know, one of the, the issues that comes up, and it came up already uh, in talks today, is uh, uh, this idea of privilege, that sometimes people might have enjoyed privileges in their lives that made them blind to things um, that are of real concern to other people. Um, and this, uh, I guess, a, a lot came up because of uh, Richard Dawkins. Uh, and so I uh, will go back to what he said, or we will if my thing will advance. Uh, here we go. Um, so, you know, he started off, he sarcastically compared Rebecca's plight with women in Muslim countries. And you know, right there, I think, you know, when somebody expresses discomfort with what somebody else did, sarcastically responding to him is probably already violating a don't be a jerk rule that, that would probably be a good rule for us to, to try to live by. Um, but he says, you know, his point was that uh, what happened to her wasn't even slightly bad, he thought, that it was zero bad. And uh, he went on to say, we'll see if So anyway, he's, he says, uh, well, but not everybody sees this as not at all bad, zero bad. Uh, why not? Uh, and he says, well, the main reason seems to be that the elevator is a confined space from which there is no escape. And so then he says, no escape? Now I'm really puzzled. Here's how you escape from an elevator. You hit one of the many buttons that's uh, put there conveniently uh, for you. The elevator will obligingly stop at a floor. The door will open, um, and you'll no longer be in a confined space. Um, and Perhaps this is Richard Dawkins' experience of being on an elevator with other people that you know, he's never thought of it as a place where you might be trapped, where things might happen to you that you don't want to have happen to you. Um, and that's an example of sort of privilege. So this cartoonist is trying to suggest, well, here maybe with Richard Dawkins and uh, I guess Ray Comfort, the banana man on an elevator. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Ray Comfort saying, don't take this the wrong way, but would you like to come to my hotel room for coffee or whatever? You know, maybe that starts to get you in the mindset of, well, yeah, actually it could be. You know, there are the convenient buttons over there, but they just aren't quite that convenient. Um, so that's you know, starting to get you in the mindset of, well, maybe somebody trapped in an elevator, especially if it's somebody bigger and stronger and between you and the buttons, it might not be all that comfortable of a circumstance. So here's an example. Um, of the sort of way in which privilege might be occurring. So we're going to do an activity now, and, and it's going to be sort of tough because there are obstacles in the room. So normally I just have everybody line up and you, you'd be able to move freely back and forth because I'm going to have you take steps in one direction or the other. Um, but we're going to sort of, because we're f really smart free thinkers, we're going to combine this with this sort of twister game that you're going to have to avoid chairs as you're taking steps back and forth that uh, hopefully it'll work out. So I'm going to get everybody to sort of line up down this middle row here, and hopefully with some room, because you may end up taking you know, five or so steps forward or backwards. Um, you don't need your cards. The cards are for something in Gene's talk in a little bit. Um, so I'm going to have everybody line up. Um, and let's see, I'll have you all face this direction from the middle aisle, and we'll hope this will work. Uh, I'm not sure. We didn't measure this. Uh, Soon you'll end up separated from each other, so that, that'll be all right. But initially, it may be a little tough. Uh, but. <laughs> oh, so we're getting just more. So I was a math major in college, but I did not calculate this correctly. So uh, uh, we could make two lines. Let's just try it with one line, because people will get divided pretty soon. And so you can. Uh, Try to avoid other people and uh, don't make anybody uncomfortable in the confined space you're putting them in. Uh, that would <laughs> defeat the purpose today. Um, what's that? Um, let's just pretend that we're good. Um, and so I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna ask some questions. So the questions will uh, be some things, uh, and I, I'll invite you to either take a step forward or take a step backward, depending on your answer to the question, or maybe you'll just get to stay where you are. Um, and uh, as far as answers to the questions go, you know, I just want you to figure out for yourself whether or not the right answer is, and how big of a step is, just try to take ordinary size steps, but if you, you, know, you might get clever and say, well, the answer is sort of yes, so I'll take a little step. You know, whatever, whatever you want to do is fine, and we'll just sort of see uh, um, whether we end up getting separated here. So, so here's the first question. 
if you attended private school, take a step forward. So that's a step in this direction. So uh, all our private school people uh, get to take a step this way, and you'll have to find a, a passageway that you can step down and hopefully won't collide too much. Good. OK, so there's our first question. Second question, if you've ever skipped a meal because your family couldn't afford food, take a step backwards. Any hungry people? You to... <laughs> oh, you're running into a wall? Uh, yeah, so maybe you'll need to scoot up this way and find a place where you can step backwards. Hopefully it won't make you go too far backwards. Good. So uh, I'm going to rephrase this one. If English is not your first language, take a step backwards. That way not everybody will have to take a step forwards. Got a few non-native English speakers. Good. If you've been divorced or impacted by divorce, take a step backwards. Getting a lot of people there. <laughs> Somebody take a great big step here. <laughs> Really impacted. Okay. If you're able to complete college, take a step forward. Able to complete college. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so for the sake of academic honesty, some of these questions I got from, uh, there are a couple of activities I found online that had these, and some of these are ones that I or some other people helping me added because they seem to fit us. Um, in fact, here's one that's just for us. If you've ever been at a Freethinkers event and felt like people were much more interested in your body than they were in your ideas, <laughs> take a step backwards. <laughs> <laughs> If you are sexually attracted to the people that your state would allow you to marry, take a step forward. So uh, if, uh, if, you're, if you're gay, don't take a step forward. Uh, that's, you know, it's kind of hard to phrase that question in a way that, uh, you know, all you gay people, Texas will let you get married. You just have to marry somebody you don't find attractive. Uh, so good. OK. If you have visible or invisible disabilities, uh, take a step backwards. If your work holiday, you can define disabilities for yourself. Yeah. If your work holidays coincide with religious holidays that you celebrate, take a step forward. This is sort of a tough one where we're a sort of non-religious group, but some of us still celebrate religious holidays. <laughs> yeah, we should get work off for that. Gar. Good. When you make mistakes, do people often attribute that to flaws in your race or gender? If so, take a step backwards. In the last month, has the possibility of your being raped entered your mind and influenced your decisions as to where to go, what to wear, or who to spend time with? If so, take a step backwards. The last month is what it said. So it was like two months ago. <laughs> Great. Are you the same race and gender as your boss? If so, take a step forward. <laughs> if you have accepted a job where people haven't taken you seriously because they thought you got the job because of your race or gender, take a step backwards. If you've never been a victim of physical violence, take a step forward. Yeah, I'm getting overrun, I know. The privileged are out. Yep. If you're frequently upset about how people like you are portrayed in the media, take a step backwards. <laughs> if you're upset by, if you're frequently upset about how people like you are portrayed in the media, that's what it was, take a step backwards. Good. If you came from a supportive family environment, take a step forward. The supportive family environment. When trouble occurs, are you reluctant to call the police? If so, take a step backward. If your parents and grandparents would have been allowed to purchase housing in any neighborhood they could afford, take a step forward. That's, I'm definitely getting overrun. Yes. Good. And uh, last question, if you have ever been in a confined space, like an elevator, with someone you worried might assault you, take a step backwards. 
Well, that was an interesting, there was a definite gender difference on the answer to that question. Good. Okay, so that's all of it. Take a look around and sort of see uh, where you ended up and see the diversity in answers uh, in the room. And uh, I'm actually standing in a pretty appropriate place. I went through to see the, my answers to these also. So, what's up? Um, I was saying take a look around and see uh, see where you are with respect to other people and I also said that I ended up in a, a pretty appropriate place knowing my answers to the questions I would have ended up here as well so uh, it's probably worth nothing none of these questions I didn't ever ask you if you're a man step forward if you're white step forward you know all of these are things that could affect somebody's life their experience with the world the sorts of things they think about worry about the sorts of things that make people uncomfortable and you know, it makes a big difference all these little things adding up and I'm sure if we'd had Richard Dawkins doing this activity he would have been right up here with the most privileged of us in the room and that probably has something to do with his just not getting it why somebody might feel uncomfortable on an elevator at four o'clock in the morning with somebody who seems to want to have sex with them um, so uh, you know, it's worth thinking about as you're thinking about these sorts of issues. If somebody says something makes them feel uncomfortable and you don't get it, well, it may be that they're overreactive, but it may be that their experience with life is quite different from yours. It may be that if they did this activity, they'd end up standing a quite different place than you are. And so that you know, helps to open our eyes to uh, the different experiences that people have. And so uh, hopefully this was a little bit useful and fun and you got to play Twister around some chairs. <laughs> so uh, so great, I'll let people find their seats and next up we're gonna have uh, the band uh, playing uh, the Prodigal Daughter for us. Welcome him home with open arms. Throw a big party, invite your friends. Our boys come back home. When a girl comes home with the old sword, it's draw your shades and your shutters. She's bringing such shame to the family main. Return of the prodigal daughter, singing, Oh, God, Nigel. Went to see a doctor and I almost died When I told my mama, Lordy, how she cried Me and my daddy were never too close But he was there when I needed him most Look, here comes the prodigal son Fetch him a tall drink of water But there's none in the cup cause he drank it all up Left for a prodigal daughter singing Oh, God, not Joe. Oh, God, not Joe. Oh, God, not Oh, God, 
Kadnajo, oh Kadnajo. And uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Jean Cazez. Um, she has an atheist blog in Living Color, and she's going to be talking to us about Elevator Gate and beyond. Uh, you could just hit this button to go forwards, usually, <laughs> through the slide. Okay. Thank you very much for having me back again. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Okay, so we have these basic events. And um, you've already heard, heard that the primary ones uh, where um, there is this elevator incident and then um, several weeks later, Rebecca Watson um, complains about it. And then at Feringula, Richard Dawkins reacts. Um, and then the next chapter of this drama is that uh, Rebecca Watson responds on her blog. She writes a post called um, the privileged delusion. And um, then the matter is debated on the internet. There's all sorts of wild insanity because I, and I think what's going on here is that this is a very complicated story with many, many, many uh, plot lines and the many different people discussing it think the story is different things. They say that their reading of what the story is varies a great deal. So the whole, the whole thing gets kind of crazy. Um, now, to sort of just outline what the issues are before I get into what I really want to talk about, um, there's the issue of whether uh, Dawkins did something bad in the way he talked to, to Watson, whether Watson did something bad in the way she uh, responded to Dawkins or to others. Um, then uh, there's the issue about elevator guy's behavior, whether it was zero bad or slightly bad or more than slightly bad. Um, there's the issue of whether skeptics should be feminists and what feminism is. And then finally, there's the issue of the gender gap and why it exists and um, how it can be closed. Okay, now, I think in the telling of these events uh, so far, um, the fact that this is all really about the gender gap has not really come out. And so, so what I'm going to do is give a sort of a prequel to the events that, that we've talked about so far. And I think that prequel sheds a lot of light on, on this controversy. And it also gets into the thing that actually really interests me, which is just why there are more Female than uh, more male than female atheists, and why these meetings tend to be imbalanced. Okay, so that's sort of the the high road issue, why they are imbalanced. But but I do want to address the the more you know juicy gossipy issue uh, about Dawkins and how he talked to Rebecca Watson. Um, so let me just say something quickly about that. Um, after uh, Dawkins talked to her that way. She wrote this post called The Privileged Delusion. And in the first paragraph, she said, thanks, wealthy, old, heterosexual, white guy. Um, <laughs> now, you, I appreciate what you've done here up to this point in talking about privilege and how it skews people's thoughts and perceptions and how we should be aware of it and so on and so forth. Um, but I, I do want to say that I think it's not good to write people off based on their privileged, uh, their being in privileged categories. I think that writing off Dawkins, because he is wealthy, and he is old, and he is heterosexual, and he is white, and he is a guy, not necessarily so good. Because I think what, if you think about what he really did wrong, and I, I agree, he did something wrong, he was dismissive. 
he had a lack of empathy um, for her. He, he just may not have known what it is like to be a woman in an elevator with a guy who's hitting on you. I, I think I understand that, and I think all the women in this room understand that. However, I think empathy is a two-way street, and when um, I think that to read what Dawkins said and immediately just write him off as, as a wealthy male blah, 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 that is not empathic either. And I think there is a kind of a duty to sort of look into it and ask yourself, why did he say that? What was the debate? What was on his mind? And I, my prequel is going to shed light on that. Um, but I want to first call to your attention one sentence from what you saw on the screen earlier. Um, this, is, this is from Dawkins. He said, and you, Muslima, think you have misogyny to complain about. For goodness sake, grow up, or at least grow a thicker skin. Now, why did he use the word misogyny there? Um, what does that have to do with the elevator? Well, it has a lot to do with it, because in fact, um, Watson had talked at three events prior to this Feringula debate, and she had used the word misogyny over and over and over again. And in fact, she had used it at a panel discussion in Dublin with Richard Dawkins sitting right next to her. And so he was accustomed to hearing her talking about misogyny. And I think he thinks she uses it too much. Now, and calls too many things misogyny. Now, that's not to excuse him. That's not to say he should have dismissed that elevator story. But a little bit of understanding um, is a good idea, even if he is a wealthy, white, heterosexual, blah, blah, blah. So that's my thing. And so after I read that at Ferengula, I really sort of th thought to myself, what's going on with this guy? What, what, what is the prequel? What was the backstory? Um, because it, did, it seemed to me that he was uncharacteristically dis dismissive. So I looked into it, and now we're going to kind of get into the prequel, and then somehow try to rise above these gossipy, juicy things and get into some, some more serious content. Okay, so the prequel. Um, in, um, at the Global Atheist Convention in Dublin on June 4th, um, this is the day of that elevator incident. The, uh, this is, you know, elevator eve. Um, <laughs> there was a, uh, a panel on uh, female atheist activists. And uh, Rebecca Watson was not on this panel, but it was the, the, the moderator asked the question, um, why are there far fewer women at atheist events? And the range is, she said, was sort of 30 to 35 percent. Um, the first speaker was Paula Kirby, who is a colleague of Dawkins who sort of in, interacts with him and writes a lot on his website. Um, she said that she did not think it was because of bad behavior on the part of atheist men. She didn't give a theory of what, why, but she just gave, gave her opinion on why not. She said that in her experience, over the years, she had not seen that. Um, then, two hours later, there was another panel uh, on communicating atheism, and uh, Rebecca Watson was on that panel, and so was Richard Dawkins, who was sitting right next to her. Um, Rebecca Watson was so upset by what Paula Kirby had said that she interrupted sort of the the uh, topic of that second panel to respond to her. And she said um, that she thought Kirby was just making an argument from ignorance. She just hadn't experienced these things herself and so was drawing too many conclusions. And she gave some examples of nasty, very, very nasty email she's received from atheists, and which she called uh, misogynist. Um, <clears throat> Then, um, several weeks later, and this is all still prior to the Dawkins outburst, um, Rebecca Watson talked again at uh, a conference, a Center for Inquiry conference in Amherst, about this issue of why there are so few women at these conferences. And she once again attributed it to bad behavior among men. Um, she said, now, I really can't read it. <laughs> if I turn around, I'll lose my voice, but you can read it. Um, she says that quite a few women uh, have talked to her about this. They've said that men do stuff that makes them uncomfortable. I think the crucial thing is the last sentence. Um, you know, and, 
and that's why they're not coming out to these events. So on th all three of these occasions, she talked about the, the sort of bad behavior and how it drives women away. Um, now, just to address the gossipy juicy thing again, I think that's the background for D Dawkins' dismissal of what she said about the elevator. And on that video, by the way, if you start it from the beginning, <laughs> um, she does talk about Paula Kirby. She talks about that panel. <clears throat> and she, she is giving that elevator story not as just a cry in the wilderness of, gee, this sucky thing happened to me. It's, she's presenting it as data to support this theory that she's been advancing over and over again. So I think Dawkins' response is, hold on. Um, I don't know about your theory. I think that you're making too much of, of incidents like that. Again, he lacks empathy. She, he's too dismissive. But I think that backstory can enable us to understand him instead of just writing him off completely as uh, horrendously in, insensitive. OK, now, enough of the gossipy stuff. Um, the issue about why there are fewer women at atheist meetings uh, interests me because um, as a woman in philosophy, I'm used to this kind of gender imbalance. There are only about 20 to 25 percent women in the philosophy business, and it's a constant subject of uh, conversation, just why that is so. And there are lots of theories out there, and so that's why I, I'm, I find this interesting. Um, so I kind of try to find out, you know, just what this gender imbalance is. I don't personally go to skeptic meetings, so I asked a bunch of people who go to a lot of them, and uh, I emailed some people and tweeted some people and got a number of about 30 to 40 percent. Um, and so then I <clears throat> asked myself about demographic factors and to what extent they explain um, that imbalance and looked at some data from uh, a survey done by Barry Cosman in 2008. And that data is extremely interesting. Um, what it shows is that in the, when you ask people, do you have a religion, um, the people who say, no, I have none, are um, about 15% of Americans. And of those, 60% uh, are male. Now, if you break down that category of nuns um, into subcategories, you see some very interesting things. So first of all, um, that the first category is those who say that they don't know if God exists or one can't know. Um, they don't call themselves agnostics, but they think we don't, they don't know or they can't know. That's 10% of Americans. That's a lot of people. And those people are even more gender imbalanced um, than the nuns. Um, now, if you go down further, you, the next group is the uh, people who think there is no God. Um, they don't call themselves atheists, but they think there is no God. Um, those people are even more in gender imbalanced. Um, there's only 33% of those are female. Now you get to the people who want to use the label agnostic or atheist and they're even more gender imbalanced. Where at the very bottom you get um, only 25% of people calling themselves atheists <clears throat> are female. Okay, so um, that's all really interesting. I think if you just, you could sort of sit and think about that table for a long time, but we won't. Um, I think that those demographics certainly go a long way towards explaining gender imbalance at atheist meetings and uh, certainly make it a, certainly a question what explanatory role there can be for these sexist in incidents. Um, now, I, uh, uh, I'm officially going to just have to say I'm an ag agnostic about that um, because I think you have to kind of take the whole range of female voices seriously. Um, Rebecca Watson says that she feels put off by these sexist incidents. She says she's talked to other women who feel that way. Um, another source, another person I'm quoting up there is Jennifer Ouellette, a science writer who goes to a lot of these meetings. She says, got to turn around, <laughs> um, I have had more negative experiences with men in the skeptic atheist community than anywhere else. You know, whoa, so quite an indictment. Um, however, when I've blogged about this issue, I've gotten a huge 
re re response, tons and tons of comments, and I've heard from a lot of women who do not like this blame the guys sort of thing. They find it implausible and they resent it. Um, so if you read the first quote um, from Jillian, she says, yeah, I'm put off, but not by these potential sexist incidents. I'm put off by this kind of excessive political, cor political correctness where I have to take a certain position um, or I'm gonna be called a gender traitor. Um, same thing with this person, the second woman, ardent skeptic, who says she's been to gobs of meetings. She's been to 10 different TAMs and this and that and the other and very goes to these things a lot. And she says, she argues that it just makes no sense for somebody like Rebecca Watson to say these incidents are off-putting when she goes to these meetings herself. You know, she's a counterexample to her own theory. Um, and she says that uh, most of these people making, saying that these incidents drive women away are at the meetings. Um, so you've got people saying yes, they drive, women say yes, they drive women away, women say no. So I, personally, my attitude is agnostic. I do not know. I think, and isn't that just a beautifully safe position to take? Like nobody can attack me. <laughs> because, because honestly, I think I really just don't know. I don't, I'm not around these kind of events enough to really observe things and have a feel for it. Um, but um, I think clearly de the demographics are a big, big uh, cause here. Um, but also, let's not sort of say that they're the whole cause. <clears throat> In the last couple of years, it's noticeable, uh, my informants tell me, how much more gender ba balanced these big meetings have become. And simultaneously, there's this, been this big push to put women on programs. Um, so for example, Jennifer Ouellette, who I uh, quoted on the previous slide, she said that at the amazing meeting number seven, she was the only woman um, on the speaker program. Just two years later, uh, this summer in Las Vegas, 50% of the speakers were women, and the uh, number of women attending had gone up to 40%. So, you know, I haven't done a scientific study here, but it looks to me from looking at a bunch of stuff that when you increase women on uh, speakers, you increase female attendance. Um, so it's not all demographics. You can do things to drive things to the top end of your range and do things to drive things to the bottom end. Um, but, but there is a range based on the demographics. Uh, to me, the really interesting question is about those demographics. Like, why is it that women are avoiding atheism? Why don't they want to call themselves atheists? Um, I have a bunch of little, you know, ideas about that. Um, and I want to just, just really quickly uh, talk about um, three, just very quickly, three possibilities. Um, I am an atheist, but I'm also Jewish, and uh, I belong to a Jewish women's book group in which basically nobody believes in God. Um, <laughs> um, but we read the book, uh, 36 Arguments for the Existence of God, A Work of Fiction. It's a funny title, God, A Work of Fiction, um, by Rebecca Goldstein. and. Um, we had a wonderful discussion about it. There's all kinds of good mockery in that book, all kinds of making fun of God and making fun of religion. And everybody talked about it and swapped stories about how silly religion is. And after a half an hour of making fun of religion, we were done with that, and somebody piped up and said, hey, want to go to services next week? <laughs> and everybody said, yeah, let's do that. And afterwards, we'll go out for Jewish food. And, and <laughs> To me, now, now, now I want to say, there was one woman there who was like, oh, barf, I'm no thanks, I'm no interest in that. But most of them said, yeah, let's go. And I think that just sort of brings out something, uh, it, it may be something about Jewish women in particular, maybe I'm overgeneralizing, but there's some desire to maintain connections, not burn your bridges with traditions and friends and family and history. And that, so that may keep a lot of women sort of on the banks. You know, in my first picture, the ducks are on the banks. They're not getting into the stream at all. Um, now, I think once you do uh, as an, as decide, okay, I am an atheist, this is important to me, and you want to kind of dip your feet in, you're not going to run to the amazing meeting right away, surely, you know, it costs money and all that. Um, but you may dip your foot, feet into the internet and then I think what you find there is just disgusting combat that like, why would you want to keep going? I mean, I think there's sort of a, 
an atmosphere of very interper very, very personal combat at many, many, many atheist sites. And I think, you know, some men hate that. Um, some women love that, you know, but I think that there's a little bit more discomfort among women. And I think at some very popular atheist blogs like Feringula and Jerry Coyne's blog, uh, Why Evolution is True, there are not a lot of women. Um, third thing is that I think at, at those blogs, there is a great deal of hostility even to certain kinds of atheists. Um, if you are the, a more conciliatory atheist who kind of cares about tone and communication and stuff, you're in trouble. You might get sort of hit over the head pretty hard. And, and so I think if there are more women who incline to that kind of conciliatory stance, you're going to get made uncomfortable long before you're like booking your tickets to some convention in, in Las Vegas. Um, Oh, okay, quack, the, the lady duck. Uh, she says, don't take, well, I, I'm, now, I'm now sounding like an elevator guy, but don't take this the wrong way. Um, <laughs> I obviously, I'm, I'm a feminist. I have no hesitation whatever to call myself a feminist. Sexism is bad, harassment are bad, so don't take anything I said to be minimizing those things or saying they don't matter. I'm just not, it's not clear to me how much, to what extent they explain attendance at major uh, skeptic meetings. Um, and then finally, I'm just dying of curiosity. There's no special reason for this, but I want to know what you all think about whether what Elevator Guy did. Was it zero bad? That's Stockton's view. Slightly bad. Now, here's a fascinating thing, if I have another 30 seconds. The big hero on Rebe Rebecca Watson's side has been PZ Myers. Now, here's just kind of something that I find just simply amazing. Um, Dawkins and, and Myers are kind of at war, you know, one is the good guy for the feminist, one the bad guy. What's the difference between their view of elevator guy? Dawkins says he, what he did was zero bad. Myers says what he did was slightly bad. Wow, you know, I mean, it's just amazing how the difference in reputation that can hang on so little difference in, in, in sort of position. Uh, but okay, so third possibility is that what he did was more than slightly bad. Um, so if you'll just take a second and write A, B, or C on your index card plus your gender. Um, later on, I will put that into a, you know, into a computer and figure out if there's any correlations with gender and so on and so forth. But so please first just write down your answer, and then I'm going to just ask for a very very honest show of hands so that we can all find out casually that what other people think. Um, well, that, all, you know what? All sorts of things would be interesting to put down, but since I didn't put that on the slide, I, I did a lot of deleting on this slide. <laughs> okay, are we done? Just A, B, or C plus male or female? Are you all done? You, are you writing a book? <laughs> Okay, now let's just have the show of hands. So, um, how many people said uh, A, zero bad? Okay. Interesting. How many of you said B, slightly bad? And how many of you said C, more than slightly bad? Okay, very interesting. And now the most interesting thing will be seeing if that uh, matches up with what you wrote on that card. <laughs> So if you want to pass that to the side, and somebody will pick it up. Final, I got carried away with my ducks. Once I found some good ducks uh, in Google Images, the last one is thank you very much for having me. <laughs>